Wyoming's Wasatch Mountains brought Union Pacific to a standstill, with steep grades forcing trains to crawl, profits bleeding away, and experts insisting no locomotive could be built big enough to solve it. Union Pacific's leadership bet everything and commissioned 25 engines so massive that even seasoned engineers warned they would rip the tracks apart. Instead, this so-called impossible machine shattered every record and every conventional belief. How did desperate ambition overturn expert consensus? And what really happened the day the world saw a train too big to fail? Freight trains leaving Ogden, Utah, faced a relentless climb into the Wasatch Mountains, 65 miles of winding rails, climbing over 2,500 feet at an average ruling grade of 1.14%. For Union Pacific, this stretch was more than a challenge. It was a choke point. The wartime demand in the early 1940s sent traffic soaring, with military equipment and raw materials piling up at the base of the grade. Every day, dispatchers watched the schedule slip as trains slowed to a crawl, sometimes dropping to 12 miles per hour on the steepest sections. Existing locomotives simply couldn't keep up. To move a standard 3,600-ton freight train over the Wasatch, crews relied on three or even four engines lashed together, often a mix of Challenger-type 4664 locomotives and older 2102 locomotives. This meant more crews, more coal, more water, and more time spent coupling and uncoupling helper engines at small mountain towns like Echo and Evanston. Each additional locomotive increased the risk of breakdowns and complicated the already tight wartime schedules. The bottleneck wasn't just about slow trains. Every minute lost on the Wasatch rippled through the entire system. Delaying shipments from California to Chicago, Union Pacific's operating costs ballooned. Extra crews and locomotives strained the company's resources while the wartime surge left little room for error. Delays became routine and the prospect of missing critical military deliveries brought pressure from both Washington and Wall Street. Engineers and operations managers pored over blueprints and tonnage charts, searching for any way to squeeze more out of the existing fleet. But the numbers didn't lie. The Wasatch Corridor, with its unforgiving grade and sharp curves, was at its limit. The only options were to keep adding more locomotives or to imagine something entirely new. For Union Pacific, the cost of inaction was measured in lost contracts, angry customers, and the risk of falling behind in a nation at war. The stakes demanded a solution that didn't yet exist. Union Pacific's boardroom, under the pressure of mounting freight delays and wartime urgency, faced a decision that would define the railroad's future. The executives rejected incremental fixes. They made a bold decision instead. In early 1941, they placed an order with the American Locomotive Company, spelled A-L-C-O, for not one or two prototypes, but 25 of the largest steam locomotives ever conceived. The contract required the first unit to be delivered by September 5, 1941, with the rest to follow in rapid succession, each one destined to attack the bottleneck in the Wasatch Mountains head on. This was not a cautious step. The commitment to 25 engines, each weighing over 1 million pounds and stretching more than 132 feet, meant staking the railroad's finances, reputation, and wartime reliability on a design that only existed on blueprints. The scale of the order was unprecedented. No other American railroad had ever gambled so much on a single class of locomotive, especially one so untested. The decision sent a clear message Union Pacific intended to solve its mountain problem with power and size, not with more of the same. ALCO's engineers, already known for their work on the Challenger class, now faced an even greater challenge. They were tasked with building a machine that could do what three or four locomotives could not, haul 3,600 tons of freight unassisted over the steepest grades in the West. The urgency of wartime production added further pressure. With every month that passed, the demand for military supplies only grew, and the railroad's window for experimentation narrowed. 
Mistakes would not just be costly, they could cripple the entire Western supply line. As the contract ink dried, skeptics inside and outside the company warned that the plan was reckless. Some argued that the sheer weight of the new locomotives would destroy the tracks and bridges they were meant to save. Others doubted that such a massive engine could even negotiate the tight curves of the Wasatch route. But Union Pacific's leadership stood firm. The order for 25 big boys represented more than a procurement. It was a declaration that the old rules no longer applied. The railroad was betting everything on a new kind of machine and the engineers who believed it could be built. Standing beside a big boy locomotive, the first thing that strikes you is the scale. From coupler to tender, the machine stretches more than 132 feet, longer than three city buses end to end. Loaded with coal and water, it tips the scales at nearly 1.2 million pounds. Every inch of its design pushes the boundaries of what standard gauge railroads were built to handle. The challenge was not just building something massive, it was fitting that mass within the unforgiving limits of existing track, bridges, and tunnels. North American railroads use a track gauge of four feet, eight and a half inches. That measurement has not changed since the 19th century. Any locomotive, no matter how ambitious, had to live within that narrow footprint. The big boys designers at Alco worked with a simple question. How much locomotive can you fit between the rails and still expect it to survive a mountain railroad? The answer required precision and compromise. The big boy's boiler, the heart of the engine, measured over 22 feet from the railhead to the top of the stack. Its firebox sprawled so wide that it needed a special trailing truck just to clear the rails. The tender, built to match the engine's thirst, carried 24,000 gallons of water and up to 32 tons of coal. Even so, every component had to squeeze through tunnels and under bridges built for much smaller engines. Clearance was measured in inches. The locomotive's width, just over 11 feet, left little margin on the tightest curves and narrowest cuts of the Wasatch. The height, just under 17 feet, brushed close to tunnel ceilings and signal bridges. The length, nearly 133 feet including the tender, meant that at some yards and sidings, the big boy barely fit. On turntables, the overhang was so dramatic that crews sometimes had to reposition the engine by hand or inch it forward to keep it balanced. Weight posed an even greater challenge. A million pounds of steel and water, moving at speed, could tear up rails, crack bridge decks, or buckle switches if not perfectly distributed. To keep the stress within safe limits, engineers spread the load across 12 axles and 32 wheels. The heaviest part, the driving wheels, carried around 545,000 pounds, but no single axle bore more than 68,000 pounds. This careful balancing act allowed the big boy to use existing track without causing the destruction that so many experts feared. Fitting such a giant onto standard tracks demanded more than brute force. It forced designers to rethink every dimension, every joint, every inch of clearance. The result was a locomotive that looked impossible on paper, yet managed to stay within the invisible walls set by a century of American railroad standards. The big boy's size was not just a feat of engineering, it was a tightrope walk along the edge of what steel, steam, and track could bear. The answer to Union Pacific's mountain crisis was not just size but movement, an engine that could flex and bend where rigid giants failed. Alco's design team reached for a solution that was as daring as it was practical, articulation. Instead of a single unyielding frame, the big boy's chassis was split into two separate engine units, hinged beneath one enormous boiler. The front engine could pivot independently, swinging side to side to follow the track's sharpest curves. As the locomotive entered a tight bend, the hinge allowed the front set of eight driving wheels to angle into the curve while the rear set followed, keeping the massive machine stable and on the rails. Articulated locomotives had powered heavy trains for decades, but never at this scale, and never with this much at stake. 
the heart of the big boy's power lay in its four-cylinder simple expansion engine. Each side of the locomotive carried two cylinders, one for the front engine and one for the rear, all drawing high-pressure steam directly from the boiler. This arrangement let the big boy produce a continuous flow of power without the lag or complexity of compound expansion systems used in earlier mallet designs. The result was a locomotive that could deliver 6,290 horsepower at the drawbar, more than six standard freight engines working together. That kind of force was essential for the Wasatch grade, where long trains had to be pulled up 1.14% slopes without stalling or slipping. To feed this power, the boiler was pushed to its limits. Running at 300 pounds per square inch, it generated enough steam to fill a two-story house every minute. The firebox, with its 150-square-foot grate, demanded a constant supply of coal, stoked automatically to keep up with the furious pace. Every detail was a balancing act. The firebox had to be wide enough to burn low-grade Wyoming coal, but not so wide that it could not clear the rails. The trailing truck, a four-wheel assembly at the back, carried the firebox's weight and kept the locomotive stable at speed. Steam flowed from the boiler through massive pipes to the cylinders, where it drove pistons nearly two feet across. Each piston stroke turned the driving wheels, 16 in total, spreading the engine's weight and force over more than 60 feet of track. The articulated frame meant that even as the locomotive flexed through a curve, all 16 drivers stayed in contact with the rails, maximizing traction and minimizing wear. Engineers at Alco spent months refining the hinge mechanics, testing scale models and full-sized assemblies to ensure the frame could handle the twisting forces of mountain railroading. The articulation was not just about fitting around curves, it was about keeping the locomotive's immense power under control. Without it, the big boy would have been too stiff for the winding tracks of the Wasatch, risking derailment or damage to the rails. In the end, the big boy became a machine that combined brute strength with surprising agility. Its articulated frame and four-cylinder engine worked in concert, delivering the muscle to move 7,000-ton trains up impossible grades while flexing gracefully through the tightest bends. The skeptics had warned that such a locomotive would tear up the tracks and collapse under its own weight. Alco's engineers answered with a design that not only survived the mountains, but conquered them. On a crisp September morning in 1941, Union Pacific's first big boy rolled out for its inaugural test run across the Wasatch. Skeptics watched closely, convinced that so much weight over a million pounds would crush the rails or splinter the ties. Crew members kept their eyes on the track ahead, but also on the dynamometer car behind, wired to record every jolt and strain. As the locomotive picked up speed, inching toward the first steep grade, engineers monitored axle load readings. Instead of spikes, the data showed a surprising evenness. No single axle bore more than 67,800 pounds, well within the limits set by existing infrastructure. By comparison, the old method, three smaller engines lashed together, had concentrated heavier loads on fewer points, stressing rails and bridges more than this single massive machine. The numbers told a clear story. The big boy's articulated frame and 12 axles spread its weight so efficiently that the rails handled the load without complaint. Crew logs from that first run note a quiet confidence as the engine crested the summit at speed, with no sign of the feared track damage or structural groaning. One fireman later recalled watching the gauge needles stay steady even as the locomotive thundered through the tightest curves. For the first time, the myth that the big boy was too big for the tracks began to unravel, not in a boardroom, but out on the mountain where evidence left no room for doubt. Tonnage logs from the 1940s and the 1950s tell the story in numbers. Big boys became the backbone of Union Pacific's mountain operations, routinely pulling trains that stretched for more than a mile and weighed as much as 7,000 tons. 
Dispatchers in Ogden and Green River watched as schedules tightened and bottlenecks faded. Where three or four locomotives had once been needed, now a single big boy handled the load, cresting the Wasatch with time to spare. On the steepest grades, these engines kept up a steady pace, often holding 40 miles per hour with 100 loaded cars in tow. Reliability soon became legend. Maintenance logs show big boys running for months at a time with only routine servicing, oil changes, boiler washes, and fresh coal and water. Mechanical crews praised the engines for their toughness. Bearings, rods, and valve gear stood up to the relentless pounding of mountain service, even as wartime traffic pushed every machine to its limits. Some units logged more than 15,000 miles between major repairs, a figure unheard of for locomotives of their size. Operating crews developed a quiet respect for the big boy's balance of power and predictability. Firemen kept the massive firebox fed, while engineers guided 1.2 million pounds of steel through tunnels and across bridges, confident the machine would answer every call. For nearly two decades, the big boy turned skepticism into routine, hauling record loads day after day, until the railroad's needs began to change. By the late 1950s, the sight of a big boy charging up the Wasatch had become rare. Diesel-electric locomotives, once a novelty, now dominated the main line. Their secret was not raw power, but efficiency. Diesel units could be linked together in multiple unit consists, called MU, and controlled by a single engineer from one cab. Where a big boy needed a team to manage coal, water, and steam, a string of diesels ran with just one or two crew members. Maintenance shops found that diesels spent less time sidelined, needed fewer major overhauls, and could run day and night with little more than routine checks. Fuel costs dropped, and so did payroll. For Union Pacific, the numbers were impossible to ignore. Three or four 1,500 horsepower diesels, each smaller and lighter than a big boy, could match its pulling power while slashing operating expenses. By 1959, all 25 big boys were retired. Some scrapped, others sent to museums. But the story did not end in silence. In 2013, Union Pacific reacquired Big Boy number 4014 from a museum in California. After six years of painstaking restoration, the locomotive steamed under its own power again in 2019. Today, number 4014 runs excursions across the West, drawing crowds who marvel at a machine once dismissed as impossible. For the crews who tend its fire, and the historians who document its runs, number 4014 stands as proof that ambition can outlast obsolescence. The big boy may have been built for a vanished era, but its legacy rolls on, steel and steam, and the refusal to accept limits. Today, engineers still face warnings that some visions are simply too ambitious. Yet the big boy stands as proof that scale and innovation can rewrite the limits of possibility. As global infrastructure faces mounting strain, from freight bottlenecks to climate resilience, the lesson is clear. Bold solutions aren't reckless if they are built to last. Sometimes the track's real test is daring to lay it further. Share your thoughts below.